Hi, Irish County. It is really lovely to be back with you all. And thank you so much um, to Sophie and to Ari for this invitation um, to share my art projects. Um, so I am going to jump straight in and share the screen. I'm just noting the time. Uh, and I'm going to do quick, let me see if I can share the screen quickly. I never seem to, it always seems a bit, there we go. We're there, we've done it, hurrah. So, hi, um, I'm going to be talking about, um, so this is a, I'm just a little introduction to, uh, to me and what I do. Um, so I am a fine artist, as, as I very kindly introduced, was introduced, I'm a fine artist and I see my art practice as this combination of the artist studio and the Bet Midrash. And it's not that, so the artist studio with kind of all the different kind of materials that I work with, and these are little thumbnail sketches of various different projects that I've done. And you can see there's paper cut, there's painting, there's um, embroidery, there's clothing, it's lots of different materials. And the Bet Midrash, this traditional place of, um, of study, um, and in each, in each of my projects, I, I often kind of quote and I play with and explore traditional rabbinic texts. And it's not like I'll have an idea or I'll kind of be learning in the Bet Midrash and then I have an idea and then I go into my studio and I illustrate it. But rather the two places, the Bet Midrash and the artist studio for me are the same place. And this is kind of, and really at the heart of my work, my practice is drawing. And it's drawing as a, as a thought process and it's making as a, as a thought process. So, and, that not, and it really comes to light in the projects that I'm going to be talking about with you today, um, this, this, this concept. Because what I often think is that if I had the same idea at the beginning of an art project as I had at the end of the art project, then there's no need for this art to exist in the world. The world is full of stuff. I don't need to contrib contribute more stuff to the world for it just to be stuff. Like it, it, it needs to, it's this drawing and making as a thinking process that is very important to me. And, and the, what I'm drawing and making and thinking I will so often start with a little scratch of an idea or a question or something's bothering me in the text or something's bothering me. And then I'm in my art student and I'm using my hands to make and as my hands are making I'm thinking differently and I'm allowing the work and the process of making to be an act of revelation and that act of revelation is what brings me actually to the Omer. So the Omer, this period of time between the Freedom Festival of Pesach where we talk about Mitzrayim as being the narrow place, Mitzrayim in between the straits, where we're released from being in the narrow place and then we're counting towards standing at Sinai and receiving. And I like to kind of, I, I think about this time and I think about in the bodily gesture of being tight and then opening up and then with your art hands open in this gesture of re receiving. And that process of being like that is a, um, it doesn't happen instantly. It is a process. It's that seven weeks, that seven, seven times seven, the 49 days, that counting that is leading up, and it's a period of transformation. And this is the mitzvah, or where it comes from in the Torah, from Vayikra. And the text says, you should count off seven weeks. They must be complete. You must count until the day after the seven week, 50 days, and then you should bring an offering of new grain to the Lord. So the Omer offering in its biblical origin was the offering of the Omer, uh, of the Omer of the barley harvest. So and you do every day they brought this, the Omer offering of the barley. And then on the 50th, on the 50th day, the day after, the day after those four, the, the seven complete weeks, brings the new grain, it brings the wheat, the wheat harvest. And so this is the biblical origin of the Omer. Sorry, that was my phone. Um, phone on silent. Um, this is the biblical origin of the Omer. Um, and it is a temple offering. It's a temple sacrifice to to bring to to bring here. Um, but after after the sort of temple was destroyed, this there's still this mitzvah to count. 
and it became a time of personal transformation. And there's lots of really interesting kind of Kabbalistic thing about going through the Sefirot, and you've got Chesed, Shabbat Chesed, like each, each one of the seven is one of the Sefirot, and then you have the combination of the of, of how they intersect in the weeks. Uh, and it's fascinating, and I'm just going to be quite honest with you, that is not something I personally engage with. I know quite a few people who do, but it's not something I engage with because Kabbalah and that way of seeing it is, is not something that, that is not something that I've kind of gone too much into. What I have kind of done though, is like I look at this mitzvah of counting, of what does it mean to make each day count? And I, just before I go into my projects in terms of using the OMA, using these seven weeks as a time of, uh, as a personal art project, I want to share with you these two very different OMA calendars that are artistic projects. One of them on the right, which is this, um, I met this guy in, in, in Italy, it was his grandfather's OMA calendar and it's a handmade book, which is calligraphy on vellum, it's about 19th century Italian. And it's a very beautiful Omer calendar and it's very, and it is a ritual object and it's the, to be used for counting, but it's also got a lot of kind of artistic merit in terms of how it was, um, in terms of how it is presented and what is expressed. And you have the, um, the candelabra made out of the micro calligraphy. You have a lot, it looks, it's a very traditional kind of Omer counting there and it's very beautifully made and it's done and it's made to be used as a ritual object. Um, and on the left, we have the contemporary artist, Toby Khan, um, Safir, and it's his Omer calendar. And these are um, 49 blocks that kind of insert into a grid and they can be inserted in all different ways. And each one is unique, and yet they all fit together. And it's like, this creates this amazing forms and light and shade. And this is also made to be a ritual object to be used in for people to, to, to count. And this is his his is his interpretation of that on my calendar. And it's a very beautiful kind of it's abstract and yet it has um it has a very practical use. It has a very has a really interesting meanings and things behind it. And that is um Toby, Toby Khan's kind of contemporary on my calendar. And here is the first day of my on my calendar and it's not I wasn't using creating an Omer calendar as a ritual object for others to use or even for me to use. Rather, the act of making and drawing itself was my counting. I wasn't just going to count the, so the traditional way of saying it. You know, you say the bracha, you say the number of days of the Omer it is, followed by the number of weeks, and then the little he ruts on about bringing the temple back because the Omer was initially tied to a temple offering so like and let's bring the temple back as a sort of thing important maybe there's a bit of a meditation and it takes maybe a minute or two to count the omer if you're saying it like that it doesn't take that long um and yet for some reason um i never used to be able to finish the whole cycle um when i used to do it like that and then this is is it back in 2011 i did this i started this omer drawing project and it will take me half an hour at least each day yet for some reason and maybe it's just a kind of tenacity plus like human nature because it took a bit long it took longer it became a much more ingrained part of my day and actually that's the first year I really counted every day of the Yomer and in terms of thoughtfully counted each day of the Yomer so this is this is the first drawing and it's day one and I was drawing I was, um, I sort of did this sort of ritual for myself where I would go out for a walk, just like a little walk around and I would find like a, something would catch my eye, often something that was lying on the ground, like a little discarded thing. Um, in this case, it was this leaf that was half kind of dead and kind of crumbly and yet still a bit of it was still green. And I brought it back to my studio and I drew it. And um, and that was my day one. It was this kind of looking for this, like the discarded, overlooked things in, 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 and drawing there. And I tagged it with this line, I am still alive. And that is a quote from a Japanese artist on Kuera. Um, and he, um, 
think he sent about 900 or so of these telegrams where he would send a telegram saying, I am still alive. A really interesting conceptual artist. Um, he sent these telegrams to his friends, gallerists, um, colleagues. Uh, and when you're sending a telegram, he himself isn't writing it. It's whoever's working in the post offices are writing it. And yet it's, it's sort of his artwork that is there. But um, this message, sending a message out, I am still alive, a certain I am still alive, because maybe when the person receives it, he isn't going to still be alive, but at the time he sends it, he is alive. And he does some really interesting work with de about dates and, and making these kind of conceptual paintings about the date and dates and time. But, but there was some, I was standing, I saw, I was in MoMA in 2011, and there were sort of various things going on in my life personally. And that actually having that phrase, I am still alive and asserting that really resonated with me of like, what does it mean to kind of stand kind of fully aware that you are alive today? I'm still alive. Like there's no guarantee that, like, that maybe that will be tomorrow, but today I am still alive. And it felt for me like that was a really interesting thing to bring to the Oma, like what it means to count each day, to notice something that you had overlooked and to be aware of, I am still alive today. So I lifted this phrase from uh, Oguera, which was, uh, and I used it here to tag each one and the, of my drawings. And here we have, um, and then I, this is from an exhibition where they were displayed. Uh, these were, they were done in kind of a, um, I think they're called A5 postcards. They're very sort of small postcards, watercolor postcards. So I would draw the object. Here you see I drew a stick. And as the drawings develop, and here you see kind of my, as the drawings develop, and as I'm thinking and what it means to be, to say I am still alive each day while bringing attention to something that would otherwise be overlooked. I kind of I kind of color crept in and color like the first one the color was there in the leaf but actually color became the shadow and it was like the shadow became the thing it was like the shadow was the the presence and the, the trace of the presence of the object became the color like we I am still alive so that was the first year that I did that and it was I was drawing sticks and bits of glass and um what else is there lots of feathers that really caught my eye and um bottle caps and you realize the streets are quite messy um so that was in 2011 oh here's a couple here's a kind of sample of of some of these drawings and they, they're very delicate they're very um i mean they're very they're very pretty i suppose uh but they're very simple um and then roll on the following year and 2012 and the, oh, the other thing to say about this is when I posted that I posted them um this was before social media in terms of um Instagram but I think there was Facebook then uh yeah there was Facebook I, I posted them on Facebook but I also had a um a blog about this and so I'd write about it every day and I'd also, I did a kind of emailing that I would email them out every day. Um, and the other, that's another th important part of this project was that sometimes as an artist, I spend a lot of time kind of going, working and overworking my drawings, like, oh, I'm not sure it's good enough and kind of being a bit of a perfectionist and everything. But there's something about this practice of you do the drawing, you send it out. You do another, the following day, you do another drawing, you send it out and you just, you get into a rhythm of that of just letting it go and let it and, and letting the work go out there in the world. Um, I'm much more kind of used to that now, but back in 2011, I mean, before that, I would do drawings that I would take weeks on. Um, these were drawings that were done in like 30 minutes. So it's kind of changed. It really changed actually how I how I approach my my drawing practice. Anyway, so. And so I would put it out publicly and sometimes people would comment on them. And I know people, some people really appreciated like this was a really interesting way for them to, to remind them to keep the email is that they would see my email. So that was another impetus that for me to keep going with this because I knew some people were, were using this as their personal on my calendar. So 
I was like, crikey, I can't let them down. I have to kind of stick with this. Uh, so, and one of the people who kind of commented a lot on what I was drawing was a very close friend of mine called Amakai Lau Levi, who is a rabbi in New York. He runs something called Labshaw, which is a really extraordinary experimental creative um, community. He's a brilliant educator and wonderful, uh, a wonderful person. And so he would often comment on these like little, little like observations. And then comes so the following year, um, he calls me up about a couple of weeks before, and he says, "Hey, let's and I, we're like let's do this together." So it was so I had to kind of be a little bit working in advance with him. Like I think we worked like one day or two in advance where. I would do a drawing and then he would comment on it and then we can. So I'll show you our first one. And we, um, and our theme was we were going to, because I was drawing all these discarded stuff and a lot of it was shards. And this was one of the pieces I picked up after I finished counting the Omer with the, these drawings and I saw this in the street and I wanted to draw it. And I realized I didn't have a project to draw it for. So I, I, and I'll go read it, it says, uh, I said, actually, I've got these, all these tags in there, so it's kind of hard for me to read the space. It says, this is a piece of broken plate found last year. Uh, I, I got, just got used to it, the way it fell to my pocket, because um, I used to carry this little shard around with me. And so Amakai replies and says, on the first day of this journey, a plate is broken, with intention, not as accident. This act of breaking is often done when two young people became engaged a sign of celebration, of promise, of fragment, sanctified as a hopeful promise of wholeness, of fixing the broken pieces. In some traditions, it's considered good luck to keep one of the shards, especially when looking for a mate. So here it is, a useless shard, perhaps a promise, a first step in the journey. In Kabbalistic terms, the first day of this count is chesed of chesed, kindness of kindness. And the last day of the count is the celestial wedding between divine and human as cosmic union. Let's collect our broken fragments on this act of reunion, kindly, one by one, 49 days to go, blessing for the journey, shard in pocket, go. Um, so we got engaged. Um, <laughs> we um, I, I found this really beautiful that Amahai would took my drawing of this like broken plate that I picked up just because I liked it. Um, and I'd been carrying it around with me and I'd been kind of, touching it it kind of felt it there was something very interestingly tactile about it and 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 I wanted to kind of explore this kind of the fragment and he took that and went off and went on and suddenly yes it's about engagement and it's about commitment and it's about preparing oneself for the divine union with um on Shavuot and it was like well and it almost was like well, yes, I planned that all along, carried around this broken piece of plate, of course. So it was quite exciting to work to sort of see how his mind took, took this to this place. Um, and so we would, so we created, um, there we go. So we created this um, project and we called it to uh, gather the broken, um, which is actually a line. I kind of borrow my titles and things from, from other, this is from a Lenny Cohen song. Um, gather the broken and it's to gather as to assemble and collect together but also to gather as in to understand and to or to sum up and it was to like what does it mean what to gather the broken it was like what does all this brokenness mean what does it mean to be in a broken world um and or have a broken heart or a broken dream or a broken promise and but really this kind of the sense of brokenness in this world we talk about um, the term tikkun olam is banded around a lot. Um, this yeah, is banded around a lot, um, and yet uh, to uh, to fix the world, and we sort of like the world must be. But what does it mean actually to live? Which means if we were if uh, if it's about to be fixing the world, then it means to live with the world in a not fixed state and accepting some of that not fixedness, accepting what it means to be broken and accepting that. So I was kind of drawing these like broken things that I kind of found around my house in the home. Um, amazing how many broken things there are in the house. I, I, I realized I had in the house um, and things that were broken. Yeah, I didn't want to quite throw away. I wasn't quite ready to throw away. There was still something very precious there. Um, and that leads to, um, 
and that leads to the this is the full project again sort of set out as a grid for it was it, when it was exhibited and I just want to sort of highlight the one in the middle this sort of broken shell um, and it's often kind of in the middle of like doing this drawing process did I kind of go I think I know what this project's about and I'd written on, on as a background to the shell is like not everything is broken can be fi fixed not everything that is broken can be fixed and that reminded me of what we were counting down to we were counting down to standing at Sinai and receiving the Lufot, these tablets of stone that even before like mythic even before they reach the earth Moses Moshe is going to break them we're counting down to receive the Lufot that will be become broken but what do we do with that first set of broken um tablets they are gathered together and the fragments are kept in the Aron Kodesh, in the, in the Ark, in the temple, with the second set. They're not thrown away. There's something precious there and they're kept. The broken is kept together with the, with the replacement. And it's kind of, can we honor, can we recognize what is broken and not have to, not to, and, but, and it's like, can we hold on to both? Can we know that something is broken and we don't and therefore it needs to be replaced? And can we get and can we replace it and yet still honor what we don't we no longer use? And that became a kind of really interesting metaphor to, to sort of explore about aspects to do with it, like personally thinking about aspects to do with our tradition or to do with kind of life of like, we know this is no longer fit for purpose, and yet we can't seem to let go of it. And it seems to be important to have both sets of lupot, the broken, the fragments, and the unbroken, which is the ones we use, and to keep both together. And that's kind of where this project kind of ended up in this like long, kind of this 49 days of, of kind of drawing the broken and, and um, gathering it together and to gather what it means to live with the broken pieces and to see beauty and to see preciousness in this brokenness. So that was um, that was that project. I'm, I realize I'm gonna go through them a bit more quicker because I'm, I'm gonna run out of time. I'm not gonna be able to talk to you about today. So the following year, I was thinking Amachai, uh, this is in 2013, Amachai, this is uh, my portrait of Amachai. Amachai uh, was busy and he didn't want to he wasn't able to kind of get sort of personally involved with it, but I quite I quite like this idea of kind of collaborating with people. And I was thinking about this process of like we go from the narrow places. Um, we've kind of acknowledged every day. We acknowledge kind of what. But what the other thing about what we're doing is what we're preparing ourselves to receive. And if we're going to prepare ourselves to receive, I wanted to explore. Well, what are we already holding on to? What baggage are we already carrying that we're also going? So I did a kind of simple thing. I said, I kind of picked, I sent an email around to some friends, um, a lot of whom were kind of artists of all different disciplines. And I said, I'm going to email you. And when you get that email, could you just let me know what's in your bag? Like what stuff, what are the little detritus, little bits, what stuff? do you just carry around with you um, without really thinking? So just, can you just empty your pockets or empty your bag and share with me what you are carrying around? Um, and because my friends are all quite lovely people, no one said no, and they all were very generous. And I created these portraits where um, I arranged their items in their pockets or their bag as, as kind of like a necklace, like a dormant, and then I drew them. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how I drew them kind of the next time. But this is kind of all, all of them together. Um, and this is, I just want to show about the process, like in terms of drawing the act of making is an act of thinking and things change and develop. So this is my day one portrait. And this was my day 24, kind of almost halfway through point. And you can kind of see like, oh, at day 24, I've kind of, I've got it. I've kind of, I understand what this project is about in the way that I didn't really. Because in, when, when I started this project, I thought the project was really the objects, the object as ornament, as adornment. Um, and, then I, and then by day 24, it was really like, 
well, no, it's, it's about my friends. And it's about drawing my friends and drawing them in a way till I just begin to recognize them. And then I pull back. So I'm drawing, so this is Alicia Joe, which is Alicia Joe Rabins. She's an extraordinary musician and poet um, based in Portland. And she, um, and so I was drawing her and I was sort of drawing her nose and her eyebrows. And then I saw her without seeing her fully. And then I, so I stopped drawing. Um, and it's kind of, again, it's like that preparation of standing at Sinai and preparing to receive and we'll talk about kind of the other, like the other who we didn't, we can't fully know God, but we can't fully know our friends either. Uh, they are other, they're separate. So this kind of the mystery that is them that I recognize, but I also don't know. And I wanted to kind of capture that in these drawings, but just to say something about the objects. So a lot of the same items kept coming up keys, coins, ticket stubs, lipstick, that kind of thing. Um, Alicia Josh, her kids were very young at the time. She had baby socks there as well. Um, so, uh, so, we had, so we had all these things. But what I found remarkable was that no, whilst the, we had a lot of common items on these lists, no two lists were the same. So even, so even in the most mundane stuff of our lives, we can't help but being completely unique. Uh, I, I mean, maybe 49 isn't such a huge sample, but it really struck me that even in this, we are that, that they are unique people, that they are they are separate individual selves who express who who express this sort of individuality in this way. Uh, and it, I, I was really kind of struck by that and kind of also in terms of what it means to stand in front of the other so I started off this project thinking about well, what baggage do we carry and I finished the project thinking more about this kind of sense of appreciation of the individuality of the others in my life um, as I stand to kind of prepare to stand at Sinai and we're gonna I'm gonna come back to that theme later on because it then took a much more conceptual thing and you might recognize there we go it's there it's there um, and this is in 2014. Um, I then kind of, I mean, it was a kind of person, I had gone quite far on this kind of personal transformation um, on my accounting. And I wanted to get back to the Omer as a kind of the biblical um, barley offering and also the, the number that like who, uh, the number of the day and to think about the number, the, the shape of that number. And it's, Often, kind of in the in the Tanakh, it, 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 like biblically, numbers are not necessarily descriptive, but they're poetic. In that kind of a three day journey is a long journey. Did it exactly take three days? But it's more interesting to say three day journeys and then think about all the other three day journeys and link those together. So I wanted to kind of look at the numbers and how they come up when they come up. In the in the Torah and also and also kind of folk culture like kind of contemporary popular culture like it, you know I mean with Pesach you have all the fours and things like that and sort of pl basically play with numbers and play with numbers in the kind of as a kind of drawing in this kind of ge geometric shape way. So um, this is how they are in the in my notebook. Um, so there you have at the top you have the first one the Allah. Um, you have the little barley grain there in its circle of who knows one. Um, I actually have my notebook here of the original one. And so who knows one, one is God and me and you and you and you and all the unique souls that are created in the image of God who is one. So that was the first one. And then... And then I went through that first week kind of drawing these um, grains of barley, um, like who knows two, two is heaven, earth, sun and moon, male and female, Jacob and Esau, Leah and Rachel, Hillel and Shammai, um, Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish, black and white. So it's kind of, I get kind of, anyway, they get more details uh, as they go along. And you see here this, um, and then, um, and it was kind of, and then it was like arranging 
So by the fourth week, I was in the third week, I arranged them in the form of a triangle in this. So in the circle, it was the circle had the, the many points as it was So on the top left there, you've got 28. So there are 28 points in that circle and I make these sort of lines between, but I also draw a four sided um, shape because it's the fourth week. And then I'm arranging the um, barley or around the four sided shape. So it's acknowledging the, the weeks and the days, which is part of the mitzvah of counting. And then as you can see, you've got the square, you've got a pentagon, you've got a hexagon, you've got a septagon, the seven sided shape, the, the, the final week. And that's the, the bottom right is the um, last drawing, um, which is the 49, which is this like fantastic, um, this kind of very detailed star. Uh, which was there and it was fun to play with the numbers it wasn't as much about personal transformation that project but it was um, a really interesting way of kind of thinking about the numbers in Torah and in our tradition and these echoes that come up in that and then kind of I'm not sure what happened in 2015 but this is 2016 I went back to it being a personal transformation and I created something called the I called the bestry of fears because I was thinking about this process of coming from the narrow place to standing at Sinai and about kind of growth and personal transformation. And definitely for me, what I was thinking, well, what holds me back? What stops me growing? What stops me transforming? And a lot of the time it's fear and it's fear of change or it's fear of the future. It's all sorts of fears. And I thought I wanted to use the Omer that year to kind of really tackle what am I afraid of? What am I afraid of? What, what, what stops me kind of going for it and, and, and just seizing that and seizing the moment and take, making the most of the opportunity? What stops me being truly, fully open to the world? Uh, so I did this project. It's kind of here. This is the notebook for, the, for that. So you see these kind of drawings. They're not particularly large. They're kind of, there we go. They're kind of small. They're, they're small little things. Um, and I also did this, I was invited by a friend of mine who worked for, works for, I think she's still there, she's at the British Library. They had just finished digitalizing their Hebrew manuscript collection. And she wanted um, me to kind of play with their digital, the online digital collection um, as an artist and like how usable was it, what they, the, what they had done. And so, I can. I said actually, Leah, I'm going. I'm doing this on my project. I about these the fears, and I can take inspiration. I can use this digital manuscripts and take inspiration because what I found really interesting um, about them are these kind of little guys. So in um, kind of Hebrew manuscripts, you you will find sometimes little beasties, little monsters little strange creatures in the margins in the marginalia kind of cropping up i mean it's they are medieval um i mean it's quite common actually in like medieval manuscripts to find them and they are delightful when you do because they're a bit nuts and um and you got this lovely fish creature here with his legs and his, i don't know and he's holding a bird and he's caught a fish and um and you just think like they're doodly, like they're having a great time, the, the kind of scribe or the illustrator who's doing this. And I mean, it's definitely sometimes there are, you know, you, there is probably a lot of meaning and the kind of interpretation and you have Mark, Michael Epstein lecturing with you and I have learned much from him and he is a wonderful enthusiast of all these like glorious things. Um, so I wanted to take my beast, my monster, my beastie, um, and I, I was wanted to kind of take the, the the monster from the manuscript and sort of create it in that form. And this was this is day five disapproval. Um, so fear of being disapproved of, and um, and this little beast is actually taken from the Barcelona Haggadah, and is actually on the page of the Four Sons. And it seems quite fitting because you've got like this kind of quite judgmental father who's be who's kind of got his four children uh, definitely four sons are, are in the Barcelona Haggadah but these like this very judgment who's quite disapproving of 
at least three of his children probably also disapproves a bit of the wise son of the work yeah uh, gives him such a bland boring answer but anyway um but this kind of disapproval so I kind of took my image my my little beastie the, who is a sort of anthropomorphized way of sort of saying this is my fear of disapproval um which is here um and and here we have this is like the the fear the, the little beast of the fear of overconfidence and I took him this is from the Yana Pentateuch, which is, and he's, I um, don't know if you can see, he's sort of here at the end. And this is um, from the Yana Pentateuch, and it's it's the beginning of the Sefer Shemot, it's Ele Shemot. And you can see there that the scribe has done these beautiful ornate drawings, and it's almost, it's like, whoops, he's run out of room uh, when he does the Shemot. So he's kind of, oh, you've got, so he had to kind of do the end of the word shamot quite small and then you've got the little bird that has kind of got this like bird just kind of quite clumsily trotting along there but I, I thought it was quite funny and quite sweet and that was my kind of fear of of being overconfident like ooh, am I being a bit overconfident and hold back um these particular monsters are uh have the micro calligraphy in them which is kind of you find in a, in a few quite a few manuscripts is kind of very traditional form of using less using word art in the illustrations here um, and I use the word monsters very specifically um, the monster is from the same root as demonstrate um, demonstrative and to to demonstrate is to make obvious to make clear to externalize and so these monsters I'm externalizing, I am demonstrating, I am making external my fears. So they are, they are my externalized fears. And by, by making them kind of a bit like this one is the sort of fear of messing up. The other one was the fear of saying goodbye uh, and ending. So it's kind of, they're kind of cute, but they're not, when I was putting them, it was like, it was quite painful to kind of, be quite personal about and reveal like oh yeah no that does hold me back that does prevent me from marching forward or or being completely open to the world or open to um as one would want to be when kind of standing at Sinai um just finally just before I go this came across this lovely little illustration of a dog licking its bottom um this is actually from a machsa for Yom Kippur and um it reminded me like of well these manuscripts were, were made individually they were made for they were personal quirky little uh quirky things but they uh, I mean they, they were very expensive things to make but they were made for for a client um and you end up with these lovely personal quirky touches and I kind of think how much better would our Jewish contemporary Jewish culture be if we could kind of have these like charming little deep things in our prayer books, dogs licking their bottoms as you stand there on your foot. Anyway, that's my plea for please bring that this kind of humor and sweetness um, to our contemporary culture and contemporary Jewish life. Right, on with that. So anyway, so I'm going to roll on a bit. So this is a more recent project. This was from the pandemic and these were love letters. I've got these are kind of a grid of, of nine of them. I sent 49 love letters because during the pandemic, um, I was kind of thinking about what I missed, what I was missing, what um, I was like, sort of like coming from out of place, out of past, uh, this sort of being feeling so narrow, feeling so um, like my horizons had gone, like my world had really narrowed, gone to a very narrow place. And what I wanted to do that year, because the pandemic being gone on and off, is I wanted to gather. I wanted to be with my friends. I miss them very much, but we were still kind of 2021. There were still kind of lockdowns. And I mean, there wasn't as there was sort of gathering, but not really. And I missed my friend. I really miss my friends. So during that time, that armor, I kind of wrote a love letter every day um to to people I missed and I realized kind of in missing them I was also missing part of me that is comes out with them 
and actually this kind of focus on friendship um so here is a kind of and I, so I'd write the love letter but then I'd sort of muck about with it because it's kind of a bit embarrassing sometimes to admit to sort of send a love letter so you want to sort of hide it a bit and then and then make it obvious again and then hide it again so I so I sent these letters out I realized I was going back to the original kind of on Huera who would send out his telegraphs so I would send out this um this is a very long source I'm not going to go through it all but this is from the Talmud in Yavamot and the Omer is often seen, you know, we don't do weddings and we don't do live music because it's a time of mourning. And it's a time of mourning for this story. And this story is one that um, Rabbi Akiva, so here's, here has the Gemara, the Rabbi Akiva had 10,000 pairs of students, um, which is a huge amount of students. And they all died in one period of time because they didn't treat each other with respect. And the world was desolate and Torah until Rabbi Akiva came to the rabbis in the south and taught his Torah to them. And the second set of rabbis were just these sort of group of um, five rabbis. And they're, and they're the ones. And so, although Rabbi Akiva's earlier students didn't survive, his later disciples were able to transmit Torah to future generations. And, and it's tradition, what this one period when they all died, this plague, and we were living in a plague when, during COVID. But the plague that they went through was from Passover to Shavuot was the Omer time. And that's why we the Omer is also a time of mourning is because of the plague that affected these students, these um, these ten. And this, they're not called it's 12,000 pairs of students. So it's Chavruta, um, 12,000 Chavruta and Chavruta is Hebrew friendship of friends, uh, but they're learning pairs. The So it's it's actually 24,000 people, 24,000 students died, but it's 20, 12,000 pairs of students of these Hebrata. And this idea of that, that, like there's something, and they, and they, they, the plague affected them because there was something wrong with their, the way they related to each other, that they didn't relate to each other with respect. Uh, if we go back to the project that I did with a Haven to Hold, where I was drawing my friends until I began to recognize them. And then I put my pen down because one doesn't will never fully know another. And so kind of like to always be a, have to have that closeness and intimacy, but enough distance that, that there's always a kind of I can't begin to sum you up. So and dismiss you and to always to be able to treat them with respect. So there is something about the Oma period, which is also about not just waiting to step to gather to be at Sinai to receive something from God, but also to transform and to almost do a tick and do a repair for the broken relationships that were Rabbi Akiva's students. So that is also maybe part of the work of the Omer. And that's what I wanted to do for myself in that kind of Omer counting of like sending these love letters out, repairing friendships that have got ruptured because of the plague that we were living through. And, and to send these out. Um, I mean, just to say something about Chavruta, um, this is from my Talmud drawings um, project of Daf Yomi. I noticed I was often drawing these like learning pairs, these Chavruta, these, these friends. And it has in the Talmud with uh, the story of Honi Hamagal, the, the circle drawer, um, finished a, like, it's a brilliant story. And, um, I've taught it recently. I was teach. I did an exhibition, and I taught at Lehigh University, and I did this text with the students with the chavruta or matuta, friendship or death, where that phrase comes from and what that story means. And it's about being connected to others and respecting that connection with others, and not isolating oneself and alone. And in context of Talmud study, um, chavruta or matuta, friendship or death is that the, the fact that friends, uh, that another can refine our thinking, can shape the way we see in the world. And it's that dialogue, that connection that actually enlarges our, um, the way, our, our Torah and, and, the, and the way we learn. Um, I have this quote here from Theodore Zeldin, which I just think is very beautiful about, um, we, we all have the power to, to kind of increase the kindness and humanity in the world. Um, and that next time when two people meet, the result could be different. That's the origin of anxiety, but also of hope. And hope is the origin of humanity. It's a very beautiful 
kind of quote there about the potential that is there when two people connect. There could be destructive, it could be disrespectful, it could lead to death, but it, it could also lead to something very um, beautiful and hopeful. Um, and now we're going to talk, talk about the last kind of five minutes. I'm going to talk about what I've been doing this year. Um, so this year, um, in contrast, in sharp contrast to the first year of drawing the discarded things on the street, I decided I was going to look up and I was going to look up and draw the clouds every day. And I was very taken, uh, I was sort of been thinking about this kind of preparing to stand at Sinai, to stand at Sinai is to look up to the upper the mountain, up at heavens and um, philosopher Rebecca and writer Rebecca Solnit she talks about kind of um, things in her book on walking, but also on the um, her guide to getting lost. Uh, she talks about that a lot of spiritual traditions and religions have the mountain and going to the mountaintop as the place of spiritual revelation, because there's, there's something about that act of looking up, of kind of that hopeful act of looking up, of that of kind of seeing oneself into, in comparison to the scale of the big skies and the big mountains. Um, but thinking about clouds, I, I thought of the Joni Mitchell song, Both Sides Now, a song that never fails actually to make me cry, especially her, the second uh, recording that she did of it, um, as uh, I think it was in 2000, and so, uh, quite a recent recording. Um, and this line, um, it's to clouds illusions I recall, I really don't know clouds at all. Uh, it's a stunningly beautiful song about living life and experiencing love and life and all things, and yet realizing that after all of that, actually, I don't know things. I don't know anything. So, with that in mind, I will share with you some. So, this is the first one. It was a very foggy grey day in London, um, and this actually I did the first one because it was going to be Yonta if I did this actually era Pesach in preparation. So I wrote kind of preparing the Seder, um, preparing spending time with family, stopping work with all the stresses it brings, clouds are gathering, some blue sky, but gathering the grey. So this sort of gathering of the grey that was coming. Um, and so this sort of, sort of transforming. So this is a later drawing. Clouds are really hard to draw because I often felt because and they're hard to draw for many things, but but they move and they shift and they change and they don't really have edges, but they have edges. Like you look at the sky and go, okay, that's blue sky and that's cloud, but I can't quite define where one ends and one begins, and you have this fuzziness and this kind of Joni Mitchell's line of I really don't know clouds at all kind of was sort of ringing in my ear the hot it's been ringing in my ear the whole time I'm going yes I really don't know what I'm doing I find this hard and this is I'm just I made this kind of sh very short kind of gif of the joys let's see if it works there we go yes so this we go have a little whiz bang through the clouds up to date um I think this is a doesn't have today's drawing in it but it has all of the other ones. So you see, I'm sort of shifting and changing, marking the sort of changing skies in London. Um, and then in New York, when I was there, uh, I sort of changed materials because I wasn't happy with what I was doing with the watercolor. And I kind of got something, these, these last ones are kind of graphite, a graphite powder, and then with a bit of the color coming in um, here. And so I think it's coming to an end. There we go. Let's start again. So I've kind of ended up now doing it with this sort of graphite powder with these kind of soft, dry material that I'm using that is very delicate and doesn't have an edge and yet the clouds are forming and they're shaping and something is emerging, but it doesn't have any strict definitions. And I'm not there yet, but I think there's something about that that is kind of echo my relationship to Torah in terms of it's not as black and white but it's about standing in the gray standing in the places of uncertainty accepting that uncertainty finding something very beautiful in that uncertainty and 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 kind of honoring that as well um 
And I'll finish with what also has been echoing through me um, as I've been drawing these, um, as, I've, as I've been drawing this as one of the, the, the life, is that is the line from um, the Tillam from the Psalms where we talk, talk about a sign. I look up, I look up to, to heavens, where will my help come? And talk, and the, that often it has, um, You know, that 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 they drift, that these clouds they drift, they sh they're taking form, and yet there's something very beautiful about um, these kind of shifting forms that are hard to pin down, and and I struggle with them, and yet something emerges here, and it kind of seems very reminiscent also of a kind of spiritual practice. So I'm not there yet. I'm not on day forty nine, but I'm kind of. Uh, um, I hopefully I will get there um, in time for Shavuot to kind of really kind of understand what this is about and not just um, an, a kind of, uh, which also echoes kind of Joni, an acceptance of what Joni Mitchell is saying of like, I really, I don't know it and yet I can pin something to it. So yes, I think I finished in time. I'm sorry if I went slightly Thank over. you so much. Like, or, um, is there any questions? Of course there are. First of all, I'd like to thank you. And I've had a lot of people here sending me messages that it's really inspiring. Oh, um, thank you. And people have been really uh, responsive. Um, I think in a very uh, emotional way, because you are sharing something very personal in, in yeah. many levels. Um, things are very personal not only your drawing, but also your text. And I think it's interesting to see how in the beginning, the project is more, a lot of visual and slowly you're, grad you're moving towards a different kind of scale, both in a notebook um, and both the, the, the text is also more of a significant part of the, of the project. Um, so I'd like to ask you about that. Um, is it something, you know, so the text kind of come, I mean, actually, I feel with these clouds, the text is hardly there. I'm not really sharing the writing that I've done on this. But one of the things I would say with that, these, these clouds is that they are so much the opposite of the first set, where I was looking down and I was drawing a discrete object that I could hold and I could pick up and I could put in my studio and I could, you know, I could touch it you know and I think and the clouds it's like the, first of all the, the, the scale of what I'm drawing is huge I mean actually the physical drawing I think they're about the same size to be honest the uh, uh, the yeah. actual drawing is the same size as the first uh, uh, in the cloud drawing as they were in the I'm still alive drawing but I think the what's different is the scale of me in relation to what I'm drawing is different mm -hmm. like I'm drawing something very big um, I'm drawing, I'm trying not to draw the cloud as an object, um, but as a kind of shifting landscaping uh, thing. Um, and I mean, that's also why it's really hard to draw clouds is that I start off the drawing and I look at the sky and I'm like, okay, I do my drawing. And then I look down to like mix some colors, whatever. I look back up and it's different. And yet, if you sit and watch clouds, they don't look like they're moving at all. But if you look and they look away for a couple of minutes and look back, they've moved, they've changed. So that's fascinating that they, that they do that. Fantastic. Can I ask you to stop the share screen so we can Sure, see yes, let's stop share. Even though it is beautiful. And, <laughs> and clouds have so much into them, and I'm sure you know. Uh, you, you haven't yet maybe you're still in the process of thinking about the clouds like you are in all of your projects which the, the process of thinking or discovering what the project is about is yes. still occurring yeah. yeah I mean there's there's all the kind of midrashim of like like God is in a cloud and like you've got the the cloud that led the Bnei Israel you know it, oh, yes. it, in the wilderness and you've also got uh, I mean, there's all that there, but I think there's also like, I definitely think there's like, like when our heads are cloudy, it's about not being fully defined. Yes. And there's something really interesting to say, like, what does it mean that we, we say 
that our God is in a not undefined, is, is, is an undefined space and yet a presence. Like how mm -hmm. do you have a presence without having a definition? Definitely. Without any definition, I think that's something really interesting. Amazing, yes. I've got a question here from Anita asking, you know, I see that you've um, exhibited your work throughout, but are you thinking of putting it all together into one exhibition or into a book? Because it is a fascinating project. That yeah, I, to share. I actually, I've, I've only now just begun because I've always done these Omer drawings, a kind of on the side of, okay, this year's Omer drawings, I'm doing this. Like, I've got other big projects going on, like I, um, and all, and the Omer drawings are kind of like a little extra I do, but over the years they're amounting to something, and I think it would be interesting to explore them as a complete project in and of themselves, and not just, um, and not just like little indiscreet things, uh, a, a little discreet things. I want. I I was actually interviewed. I um, there was somebody interviewed me this year for an article they wrote about um, Omer artistic projects. Uh, I know a couple of other artists who use this time as an, to do an art project and to do drawings, and some who do more like Kabbalistic kind of engage with that Kabbalistic thing. Um, uh, I mean, I... I, I I, I don't know why I'm stumbling over this. I think I was one of the first artists to do it as my drawing a day, my drawing is my counting rather than I am creating on my calendar for other people to do, but I might make them all together. Or I'm not going to specifically make them each day. So, and I think I was, um, I, I mean, I didn't know of any other artists who did it before me. I know, I know a few artists who've done it after me who have directly kind of been inspired by my work. It's just always, maybe as I'm English I just feel a bit bashful saying like I did this and then other people copy I don't know they copy me but like but and actually I'm really pleased about it because I think the whole point about it is it's a personal transformation and I would encourage anybody anybody to use the Jewish calendar and to use ritual as an invitation or an opportunity for creativity in whichever way that personally speaks to you like you know if writing kind of poetry is your thing or if or kind of um like whatever whatever is your medium of expression it's like the calendar is there as like ha it, it's what is our relationship to ritual like is it something we like you say the bracha and you do and then you get on with it or is it to, to take it personally and I think you uh, that for me it's like take it personally whatever personally is for you yeah. Beautiful. Really beautiful. Um, really, thank you so much, Miriam and uh, Judith. A lot of people are just thanking um, oh, you in a very sincere way, you know, for sharing your creativity and your ideas and um, taking part in. And also this relates to something that Tybell said, you know, asking me about are there any other extended periods of time in the Hebrew calendar um, which inspire you. So you were just relating to that as a as a place to use the the ritual yeah. calendar as something for your own creativity. So with Amichai La Levi, I've done. Um, he does something called prepent, which is a forty day counting up to Rosh Hashanah. Um, oh no, it's is it forty? No, it's not pre. It's 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 forty days counting up to Yom Kippur. So. It starts on the first of Elul, on the first of Rosh Chodesh Elul, and then goes all the way through. Yonki, and Rosh Hashanah is like within that. So he's done a prepent. He does a prepent each year with now with Labshul. And I've worked with him on a couple of those projects where I've produced artwork for those, um, for him. But that's, it's been very much like that's been, been me supporting his project. It, in the way that when it, he did the homage project, it was like my Oma counting that he came in on me. So we've done that. So the pre, so so Rosh um, Rosh Chodesh Elul going up to Yom Kippur is another time that can be done. Um, I mean, really pick anytime. 
like any time. I mean, I've, uh, there's a ongoing little thing in the back of my head that I want to do a kind of monthly thing, maybe on the actual calendar month and think about that and maybe do some like learning and drawing prompts as a monthly thing, which I'm thinking about maybe developing that. But um, yeah, it's, okay. Okay. I'm not sure. I mean, there's stuff yummy as well. So yes. I'm just learning Pedro Talbot and doing, and I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Jacqueline. Really, I feel like I continue talking to you, and I've got many more questions, but our time <laughs> has, is limited. And uh, <laughs> thank you again. And sure, I'll send out to all of our crowd the recording and a few of the links that I followed. Thank you all, thank you. Um, and hope to see you here again on CSP. Have a great Be evening. Good night. Thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure. Don't forget to count the armor. Don't forget to count the armor. It's not yet <laughs> done for me. I can't count yet. Still day 39. <laughs> okay. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.